Yes, Christine and Sarah, thanks so much for being here today. Welcome to Google. Is it both of your first times here? We've been here a few times. A few times, we have friends oh. at Google. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of them are here. We love your cafeteria. Love. <laughs> Wonderful. You had some great sushi today, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, tell me a little bit more about how you met and how you came to build this business together. So, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Okay, great. <laughs> so, Sarah and I have actually been friends for, I would say, now 15 years. It's been incredible. We met as interns at L'Oreal in Korea and somehow moved over to New York at the same time in 2008. Continuing our care careers at L'Oreal, I did a quick detour for a master's program, but joined her again at L'Oreal. We were always in different brands, but colleagues. So we would meet after work, drink, um, sheet mask while we drink, which is also like a very important <laughs> differentiator. And we both realized over time that we were, as marketers and product developers, very often working with Korean manufacturers. And this was because whenever we would have these vendor meetings, we would always notice that Korea really had these amazing out-of-the-box innovations that just beat everyone else out of the water. And we also noticed at the time K-beauty was being talked about a lot more, but the brands that were being brought over were being done so in a very promotional way. It was more about the cutesy packaging. It was. There was not a lot of brand longevity or building happening. So we thought, why not bring over brands that we're personally passionate about, innovations that we feel like deserve that global platform, and do it ourselves and curate clean, cruelty-free indie brands that could really make a difference in women's skincare routines here. So that's how we started. Hmm. We were um, working at L'Oreal for a long time, both of us but we quit our jobs. Um, it was a huge adventure. Um, our parents were very much against the idea. <laughs> Why leave your cushiony job um, that you were both passionate about, but we just believed in this so much. So we decided to jump right to it. We didn't want to waste any time. We felt the timing was right. Actually, if you're ever thinking about entrepreneurship, timing is really, really critical. You have to see where the wave is going, the trend is going, and make sure that you're the first to speak about something that's relevant. Um, and we decided to buy our flight tickets to Korea. So we flew to Seoul, we walked around streets of Seoul, walked into all these beauty stores that we were really in love with, started to collect our favorite products and cold called and cold emailed 30 brands that we were interested in curating at that time and got responses from nine brands, signed contracts and came back two weeks later. And that's how our website, glowrecipe.com, started. Um, we started with a small platform um, where we just photoshopped ourselves and hired people from across the globe um, to make sure that we're just efficiently maximizing our budget. And, um, and then we were up on our site live a month later. So I don't think we slept enough for the first <laughs> month, but it was something that we were so passionate about. We were never you know, uh, stressed out. Actually, we're just so excited to just get this out the door, introduce all these amazing products, but also um, the beauty of Korean skincare. And we just felt like the education wasn't there in a proper way. And we wanted to leverage everything that we've learned from Korea, from our moms, but also from L'Oreal um, to the world. So kind of to follow up on that, um, one of my favorite things to do is to read the early life section in Wikipedia to kind of understand, you know, where did this person come from? What was their background like? Um, was there anything in your, you know, childhood or college years that you think contributed to you both becoming successful businesswomen today? That's a great question. We both call ourselves third culture kids. We were talking about this at lunch earlier because we live really, we really have lived all over the place. So. I grew up in Louisiana. My dad was doing his graduate degree there. Saw Shaquille O'Neal before he became Shaq. Um, and then moved back to Korea for middle school. And it was such an awakening at that time because culturally, yes, of course, things are different. But being middle school, my friends were already starting their skincare routine. And here was me having come straight from the US, never used sunscreen, like raw, and then into this beauty scene where everyone was already starting to do their like toner, their cleanser, their you know moisturizer, their SPF, and almost that moment, and 
and, and really indulging that self-care moment already. And they were learning this from their mothers and their grandmothers. And then the rituals that would take place, whether that was going to the bathhouse every weekend with your grandmother, but using household items to like treat the face. So because she was very thrifty, she would only use like kind of spoiled milk, but she would bring mm -hmm. the carton along and we would splash that on the skin and you would see this immediately brightening effect. But the reason for that was because milk has lactic acid in it. So there's science behind the method, but all of these homegrown remedies was just, it was a fascinating entry into K-beauty for me at that time. Yeah. And I still remember my mom telling me, um, you know, you want to take care of your skin, now, and it, I was in my teens, so that later down the road, it actually respects you back and it'll prevent your skin and your body and your mental state to, to always um, prevent yourself from be, being extra stressed out or worried about other consequences of not taking care of it properly. So taking care of skin actually meant overall health. It was a very holistic approach um, that I've learned and Christine also from our moms from a very young age and I think that trickled down to what we wanted to do as a mission for Glow Recipe because we think that skincare should be holistic and it's a philosophy that we're truly passionate about where you should be it's a it's an extension of your body just like you have to listen to your body and and see if it's extra tired that day or dehydrated maybe you were flying around too much you're stressed out and it shows on your skin. There's also a saying that in Korea, um, your skin is a reflection of your mental state. So if, it, if, it's, if it's extra breaking out or if it's showing these little signs, then you have to really take a pause and, and listen to <coughs> what's happening. Look at your lifestyle, um, the overall sort of approach that you have. And then I think that's when you start really thinking about, okay, how do I really customize whatever skincare routine it is to you know, geared towards what I need and what it's telling me that it needs. So today with Glow Recipe, we say, you know, take it day by day. Um, every day is different and every skin is different. So listen to your skin. And as a company, we want to give all the tools and the innovations and the products and the tips and tricks to empower you to really, again, listen to your skin and give it what it needs. It's amazing how you took and translated a lot of the, you know, homeopathic ways of doing lactic acid, milk, and maybe translate this into a whole business and while retaining the cultural elements. So I respect that very much. And I'll hand it off to Paulina. Yeah, and I, I think you're great storytellers and it's always, you know, hearing you talk, it's so easy to learn from you. So I'm just wondering, when you were just starting off, you said education is so important. How did you, how did you go about educating people? Because skincare is really complex. We know from a lot of clients we work with, it's really hard to educate people and get people, get things to stick with them. Yeah, so we broke it down. Um, you know, we, we took a step back once again and really thought about what affected our approach to skin. And it was number one, being very diligent in general. So what we learned is that the Western world, the approach to skincare has been a little bit more on let's repair this approach versus let's prevent the problems. So we wanted to really shift that mindset, which is why we were always talking about the routine overall that could fit a specific skin concerns, but how you can approach it on your lifestyle too. So we gave options. You know, you don't have to stick to five or 10 steps. One day you can have two minutes during your busy lifestyle, or maybe you're in flight and you just want to have that extra glowy result um, as, soon as, as soon as you get off the plane. So by situation, by routine, by the different concerns, we were giving these options of the routines that we felt were the best um, for those scenarios. And then, of course, we broke it down by ingredients, um, all of the natural ingredients that we were really passionate about, whether it's from Korea or elsewhere, we really kind of um, broke it down by what it does for your skin, but what it also does for the overall routine and why you need specific steps. So we really dug into the whys and the ins and outs of um, every detail. So you'll see them, um, the, some of the tutorial videos on our Instagram and YouTube, but we were really passionate about sharing that know-how and the knowledge and always combined it with the overall approach um, as opposed to trying to sell a product each time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like sometimes skincare can be really overwhelming with the 12 steps, but Glow Recipe is really approachable. You can have your watermelon spray 
um, on your desk and, and use it to refresh. So I think that's really great. Um, and kind of going back to your start as friends, you know, it's as co-founders, sometimes it's hard to be friends as you're starting. And we hear all different sorts of stories from entrepreneurs. So how did you approach being close um, and maintaining your friendship as co-founders? So I think the thing that's unique about us is that we've been friends for so long mm -hmm. and have been confidants and colleagues also for so long that a lot of our friendship in the very beginning stages was actually based on the fact that we would meet after work and talk about work. Hmm. <laughs> Funnily enough, it's very similar today too, but we're both so, I guess, passionate about what we do. It's just, it's such a big part of our lives. And the fact that we understand that about each other and can bounce ideas off each other and kind of forge these new concepts and these new directions because we're forging it in this heat of discussion, it really brings it to a new place. And I think we both recognize the value of it. But even outside of work, I mean, people say, don't you guys spend enough time together? And <laughs> Somehow we're taking vacations together with our husbands and my child. Sometimes we share hotel rooms. We share hotel rooms. Because it's just so expedient. Like you're in bed sheet masking and she's in her bed sheet masking. We're both on our phones emailing and then we like bounce ideas off each other and it's like 12 o'clock and we're like, we need to stop. <laughs> but it, it's just been such a foundational part of our business that it feels like second nature now. And we have seen a lot of stories and examples actually IRL out there of founders not getting along. Yeah like having conflict ultimately in that conflict affecting the company. Mm -hmm. And I think that comes from the fact when you have two founders that don't have their values and their kind of work ethic and direction aligned. But because we've always been in such alignment, mm -hmm. it's been very different from the start. Yeah. yeah, one thing to add is we always get questions on how do you both divide roles? Um, if somebody, you know, is one of you guys more finance oriented, is another person more product oriented? Um, and it's actually true. If you, if you look around, a lot of the co-founders have very distinct roles. But we have overlapping roles, right? We both have marketing and branding experience. We've done product development in the same company, actually. And I think it's a very fresh perspective that actually having this similar background is what makes it more successful for us to be co-founders because sometimes you don't have to explain an extra thing that you already know because she, I know that she'll understand and vice versa. Um, or sometimes we just know that where our methods might be different but the goal is the same. So we kind of already have that understanding versus if I don't know this field, I want her to explain everything to me and then that's another amount of workload or there's just like misalignment in general if you don't think alike. So I think for us, that's been a secret sauce as well. I want to go a layer deeper there. When you first started this company together, did you negotiate or discuss how are we going to manage conflict or provide feedback to one another in a way that doesn't feel personal? Did that ever happen at no. any point? No. <laughs> <laughs> so in the beginning days, because we, to Sarah's point, had marketing and product development backgrounds versus legal accounting or finance. I will say we didn't really like draft up an agreement in those terms. <laughs> but I think because we talk so much, our team is actually always teasing us about the fact that they'll tell one of us something and then somehow they'll turn around and the other person already knows. It's because that communication mm. flow is already there. I, 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 we've never had an issue with it. Yeah. yeah, and we have we share the same office, so if there are questions, we would just shut the door and talk it out, and it's super um, clear. And I think that's just been again like another way to address things that might be confusing or just something that you want to talk about. And I think that transparency, honesty, and openness has been really helpful. So kind of moving along, you know, on that point, um, you guys are lucky to have the bond that you do. Um, a lot of people find that starting a business can be exceptionally lonely. You know, yeah. you were at L'Oreal before, we're at Google, so we have ample time to socialize, build networks, yeah. come to events like this. How did you stay grounded or cultivate a support network um, in your early stages? So our number one support network is actually this, because I can't imagine going through the highs and the lows that we've gone through with this business and doing it alone and not having like a sounding board that you absolutely trust and will understand. Because you'll, with the entrepreneurial journey, what I thought was interesting is that no one is in your shoes. And 
even though your friends are so supportive, they don't really know what it's like. And to have someone who really does know what it's exactly like has been really, really helpful just for my own mental health. And then outside of that, meeting other founders has been really just one of the best parts of the job because you just meet a lot of people who have their own like very specific ideas and vision about what they want to bring to the world, how they want to execute it. And then you kind of have that camaraderie from being going through something similar. So that's been a kind of a great secondary network. And I would say that our last network is actually our team. So having started this with the two of us renting out a back office from some other company, <laughs> that company actually no longer exists, which is really sad, but they gave us incredible help in the beginning. And <laughs> what, they actually just very generously gave us one of the back offices mm -hmm. in their floor for a great price. And, because we're self-funded, we're still self-funded to this day. Um, it was one of the reasons we could start the way we did. But we never take for granted that we have team members now because we know what it was like packing boxes until two in the morning with our own hands, writing handwritten notes in every single package. And to now have a team to like bounce ideas and discuss, it's a gift. So I think our team members really bring that extra layer of support for us. Yeah, so you've, you're self-funded, as you just mentioned. Um, how are you thinking about the next few years? Are you thinking about fundraising? Um, how has that journey looked, and why did you decide ultimately to not seek out funding? Yeah, I mean, we were on Shark Tank, and I think mm -hmm. it was a crazy, amazing, exhilarating experience. Um, and we got offers from three out of the five sharks. We shook hands with one of them. And we decided to not take any funding, actually, even when the opportunity was there, because um, at that time we were profitable. I think we were looking for a strategic partner for mentorship and, you know, somebody who could supervise us to get to the next level, help us with networks. Um, but, um, you know, that wasn't really the case in that moment. So we said, OK, let us just figure it out ourselves. We have the cash um, that we need for now. Let's be nimble. I mean, it wasn't something that we could accelerate in the, in the pace that um, we wanted at that time. But I think, of course, having these key milestones and staying true to our vision really helped to get to where it is right now. And even today, you know, with a team of 30 people, we are profitable. But I think we're thinking about, OK, what is the next step to get to the next threshold in terms of the accelerated growth, but also to compete with the top 10 skincare brands, for example, in Sephora. So there are some uh, meetings that we're having, but we want to make sure that it's the right choice, the right partnership when the time is, is there. And I think that um, it's a fun exploratory exercise that we're going through right now. But, you know, we will only hold hands with a partner that we think is the right fit. Yeah. yeah. And as you've been bootstrapping this, have there been times where you thought, I don't know if this is going to work, or any time when you felt like wanting to give up? Absolutely. I think there's, once again, always highs and lows. <laughs> and there have been incredible opportunities like Shark Tank or partnering with Sephora for the first time or going on QVC or you know, finding a new retailer partner or an international market. Sarah actually just got back from our first ever international pop-up in the UK with Cult Beauty. So each time we hit one of these milestones, it's incredible. But behind that milestone is a lot of back end and logistics and shipping products and paying vendors ahead of time and all of these things that you don't really see on the surface. So making sure that that we call it conducting an orchestra, mm -hmm. like that orchestra is like playing harmoniously, <laughs> is a bit of a juggling act sometimes. But I think we've gotten to a place where because we are now planning ahead, we know exactly where the demand is coming from. And because our growth has been explosive, but at the same time, we have a better idea with like the new team members we have on board on how to plan for that. Mm -hmm. It's been a lot better. I would say compared to coming from a large corporate world, um, it's at least five times harder in terms of just the amount of stress and the workload. But the level of accomplishment and the achievement and, and the reward, mental reward, is 10 times bigger from our previous lives. So at the end of the tunnel, there's always the light that we have seen. And what we decided, we talked it out actually loud with the team as well, is we need to be able to celebrate the little moments. And that's what will keep us going, because we're not a single-minded team. We're still a startup. We're molding our business as we go. And that sometimes we'll make mistakes, and it's OK. It might be really stressful. 
but we're going to have to just celebrate the small wins and then just kind of have fun along the way. Yeah. yeah. And speaking of wins, you've had some exciting launches <laughs> recently. Um, and I, I was just at Sephora and you're kind of all over Sephora. So I'm thinking, you know, as you were as you were going about this with your own funding, very nimble, how did you get Sephora to come on board to kind of support your brand? Um, because it's been such a, a way to grow the brand. Yeah, so in the <laughs> early days with Sephora, it's always been a special partnership because Sephora was one of those retailers that first jumped on that K-beauty trend mm -hmm. when it was starting to peak here in the US. And what was interesting was because they saw the content we were creating already, we actually partnered with them on one of the very first K-beauty animations that took place, I think it was 2016? Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> 2016. And concepts like splash mask, for example, are literally words that Sarah and I sat down to make. It wasn't a word that existed either in K-beauty or in the US, but because the the Korean product, for example, was called, I think at the time it was called padding water pack, which wouldn't really translate here. We were trying to <laughs> encompass with concepts and education on how these words would translate here. And it kind of spawned the birth of a new category, which was really exciting to see. And another example of that would be something like aqua peel or milk peel, which is inspired by K-beauty facial mm -hmm. trends. Um, we had talked about press serums or pulp essences. And so we worked with Sephora on bringing some of these concepts to the forefront of this animation, which I think was an incredible moment for not just K-beauty, but for skincare. Because it's such a statement for a retailer like Sephora to put these concepts that are very new mm -hmm. in the front of their store and educate every one of their customers on it. So that was an interesting way to kick off the partnership. Yeah. But at the time, it wasn't Glow Recipe Skincare, it was our curated products. So mm -hmm. one year down the road with our partnership, we actually, after a lot of discussion, launched Glow Recipe Skincare, which is the fruit-based line that you see here. Um, and it was based on, once again, a lot of mutual discussion on what we wanted to bring in terms of K-beauty inspiration and innovation, but in a way that made sense for, once again, that global audience. I still get chills thinking about the moment that they decided to take our own brand um, because we had already sort of built that credibility with them and a really great partnership, but it was a curation business model, right? So, you know, we, we knew that we wanted to create our own brand. Um, we were very passionate product developers back in L'Oreal, and so we were waiting for the right moment to do this project. And we were inspired <laughs> by our grandmothers rubbing watermelon rind on our skin when we were growing up, when we had heat rashes all over our backs and arms, and we saw miraculous results of soothing hydration. So we wanted that fruit to be the hero ingredient to tell the story of a Korean, Korean beauty-inspired facial mask, which was the birth of the Glow Recipe watermelon mask um, that we have samples of. So initially, we had this idea. We were so excited about it. Um, and we were thinking, what would be the best way to pitch this idea to Sephora and have their buy-in? <laughs> and um, it really started as a, a casual conversation, actually. We had lunch with um, the team at Sephora, and we had a little lab sample that we thought was in a good place. It wasn't final, but we were really excited about the texture and the scent that it already had. And we had a little concept slide on our iPad. We went to lunch, and we said, you know, we have this idea. We just want to run it by you and see what you think. Um, so we share this background of why we thought of this inspiration and the idea of you know, bringing this K-beauty aspect to the product, but also combining it with what we thought was really a condensed routine in one product that is really practical for the American consumer. So we showed this. I remember <laughs> this buyer, she smelled the pod, and she said, we're going to have to launch this. When can we launch? So that was, that was a really big moment. Um, we then flew out to Korea again to develop this formula to the end, made sure that we partner with them very closely, Sephora peeps, on packaging as well. They're really in the kitchen with you um, if they believe in, in the brand. So that was 2017 when we launched in May. And like you said earlier, that product really was a cult favorite item that sold out a few times. <laughs> Yeah. So that's how it all started. And it's so fascinating. I I think of Glow Recipe as a direct-to-consumer brand because you have so much control on your storytelling, and I, I, I think it aligns with a lot of the other direct-to-consumer brands we see popping up. Um, so it's so interesting that you started at a retailer, but we're still able to build this community. 
Yeah. How, how do you manage that? And as it keeps growing in retailers, how can you control yeah, the messaging? Yeah, that's when, a really good yeah. question. I think what we always, always ask um, when we start a partnership with a retailer is that we have um, the freedom to have the same product and content on our website at the same time. You know, we want to have that independence, but also the bigger purpose is to have the storytelling destination because oftentimes in retailers' product pages, there's only so much space, you know, and you're competing with so many other brands. They have their own structure. You have to fit in that. And you don't have sometimes enough place to even put your visuals or the whole story of why you created this product or education videos. So actually, I think the retailers appreciate that there's a lot of content that we're able to provide and offer at launch on our website. So it kind of creates this 360 flow where you will buy, um, if you're, for example, a beauty insider at Sephora, but you'll learn about our product a little bit more from Glow Recipe. And then the third place um, that we actually are really, really rapidly growing is Instagram and YouTube as well. So a lot of people go there to check us out with our content. And so it's been a really nice flow. Um, and that's also a way for us to keep that independence. I will add to that that the reason that Glow Recipe Skincare was able to kind of rapidly grow the way it did was because we had that built-in community mm -hmm. um, from years of doing GlowRecipe.com as a curation business. And over the years, this community really grew with us. Some of them still email us saying, I remember when you wrote handwritten notes and we're like, we really wish we could do that right now, but the business is just in a different place. But it just shows that history. And I mean, without their support, I don't think the brand would have taken off the way it did. And even to this day, um, I think recently Stylophane Analytics um, had a chart that showed that among beauty and skincare companies, we had one of the highest engagements. And, mm -hmm and not to mention growth rates, but the engagement piece was really what was telling for us. And once again, it's because of that community. So this year, what we did was we launched a community account. So we have Glow Recipe, which is our Instagram main handle, but we also have Real Glow Gang. And this is kind of a safe space for our community members to engage, ask questions. We sometimes post certain questions, like if your skincare routine was a movie, like what would it be called? Like that type of thing. And then you'll see like answers. And it just, once again, it's that, great, like lighthearted space to just really talk and love skincare. So it's a it's core focus for us. I want to touch upon some things that you mentioned earlier. And actually, one of them is the community aspect. You know, how did you go about building that? Um, was it specific hiring choices, part of your voice and messaging coming through? How did you think about that process? So for a community, do you mean like community management or just building our community? In? Building the community in general. Well, in the early days, because we were, once again, like in such close sync with our customers, we knew our top 100 customers' names by heart because we would see them like order on the site. We were checking orders every day. We were shipping. And then as the business grew, you kind of lose that because you're not the one shipping anymore. We got a warehouse, <laughs> of course, and like all these steps you take. But we tried to continue that connection in ways where we were checking the Love at Glow recipe, which is our customer service inbox every day to still get a sense of what people were saying. And if customers had like a clear reaction or a clear point of view on something, we did our best to also react to it. So a good example is the blueberry cleanser that we initially launched with for Glow Recipe Skincare and mid-2017 was actually in a navy tube. I don't know if any of you guys remember this. Um, but we were told that the customer wanted to see the product and kind of feel that same sensoriality that they do with the watermelon mask. And you'll very often see that we house our products in these glass jars, not only because they're recyclable, because it adds to like the overall sensoriality of your skincare experience. And so we moved to a pump, which was easier to use. You could see the formula. It's plastic, it's lightweight, um, and all of these considerations that once again we took their feedback in place. And I think that kind of reciprocal relationship where a brand is no longer dictating to you, your brand is part of your conversation, is really, really important when you're building that community. And Sarah, earlier you had mentioned timing is so critical in beginning the business that you two created together. Um, at Google, you know, many of us do go on to start our own ventures or to join um, ventures that friends or former colleagues have started. Um, when is that right time? How did you come to that decision? What factors did you look at? I mean, I think it really depends on what, where you're at with your life, um, what you're really passionate about. 
and what you're good at as well. Um, so I always say, you know, it's always about finding that balance of, again, like what you're passionate about, but you can't just be passionate and jump into something that you have no knowledge about. You know, you should do a certain level of research. You should have a certain amount of network. You don't need to have a lot, but you need to have some pool of resources or elements where you can actually at least have a great starting point and then thrive after. So I would say, you know, the fact that we have this Korean beauty heritage obviously helped and we were seeing a lot of Korean beauty um, sort of, you know, keywords on Google and aspects of it sort of about to explode. So we sensed it. And the fact is, you know, we were in this beauty world already and we were monitoring what was the next big thing, because when you're doing product development, that's what you have to see. I mean, that's your job. You have to project the next 10 years and see what's going to be the next big thing. It's always part of the conversation. So we were wired and trained to kind of look at the world that way in the beauty space. And we were so passionate about our upbringing, our heritage, but also beauty. Um, I, I just cannot imagine myself doing anything else, actually, because it's just been such a passion, but also my entire career and same with Christine. So I think, again, it depends on you don't have to be, you know, a chef to, to you know, make sure that you're only going that path. But I would say make sure you have a certain amount of research, knowledge and think about what your superpower is, even if it's a small one at that point, how can I be different from everybody else? And I think at that time, K-Beauty was starting. We weren't the only ones starting, but we were the only ones talking about natural, cruelty-free Korean skincare, and that was our niche. And so that was really important. We also did our research with the Google team, actually, mm -hmm. at that time, looking at you know, the key trend words that were coming up. And glow was definitely one of the key words that we knew was going to explode. But also, natural skincare was a category that was growing, the only category in skincare in double digits. So we knew that we were personally passionate about it, but everything sort of merged at the right time. So yeah, a good amount of research is necessary, is what I think. So you used a lot of data-driven, you know, <laughs> analytics, used your Google team, <laughs> love it. <laughs> um, so kind of on that line, you know, it sounds like when you built this business, you looked at a lot of factors, you looked at hiring, organizing, yeah. logistics. Um, you know, what are the top three lessons that you would share with budding entrepreneurs today? Um, we'll split the number <laughs> of lessons between us. Um, I would say that tap into your network is such an important one. In the beginning, because we had limited resources, it was no longer L'Oreal budgets, we were pulling favors left and right. It was like a friend of a friend had a lawyer friend who could help us with this contract for like however much, <laughs> or accounting, like a, an area we just don't have familiarity with. So we would call my uncles, like somebody. It was just like a whole <laughs> really leveraging your resources in your network situation. And you learned how to get resourceful and scrappy about it and gritty about it. And I think it taught us a lot of good lessons too, because I think one of the things that we often see in the startup space is a very new startup flush with tons of funding and then kind of losing that startup mentality of still being gritty when you need to be to really maximize every single bullet. Um, and because we had such a long period of being very resourceful, I think that kind of culture permeates our entire team and it challenges them to come up with really creative solutions and really like next level evolution. So we're proud of that. Yeah. And I think another thing is um, at the end of the day, you're always working with people, whether it's your co-founder or your team, but also externally. Um, so treat people with respect is something that I think is so, so important um, in life, but also as an entrepreneur, because everything comes back. And I think that, you know, looking back when we were just starting, like Christine was saying, we were trying to tap into the network, but there were people that were very busy um, that we couldn't really reach. And, um, I, I, you know, there are people that speak to the, you know, certain types of philosophy that they believe in, but I think you have to really act on what you believe in truly. And so if we can, we still try to, you know, have um, mentees speak to people that are passionate about starting their own business. Um, even if it's a few minutes of the day, we actually really, really enjoy doing that. And I think um, that comes from the fact that we were in 
a large corporate for over 10 years. And having that mentorship or that buddy system in the company had been so inspiring for us and we want to help others get to where we are as well um, in any way we can. It can be a small act of just being polite um, or it can be you know, showing respect to others in a different way. Um, but I think that respect is such an important element that we are so passionate about. Yeah, and at, um, you know, you mentioned mentorship was something that you liked about being at L'Oreal. What were some things that coming from that world you decided to kind of steal with pride or things that you said, you know what, <laughs> no, I, you know, Glow Recipe is going to be a little bit different than mm. this corporate structure. Mm. So there's a lot of passionate debate at L'Oreal. It's a very, and I say this with so much love, it's a very French culture where their debate is welcomed and sometimes gets very passionate and there's some like, pounding of the tables <laughs> and things like that. So we try to bring the debate element over. So when we have team meetings, it's all hands. Like everyone speaks whatever level you are. And if your idea is good, it can be implemented the next day, no red tape. Like it's just really about that merit. Um, we maybe a little less pounding mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and just more discussion. But that was one of the elements that we really wanted to keep on going. Because once again, that element of forging the sword in the fire is something we believe in very much. Yeah. Um, and I think the balance of your intuition and creativity with data is really important. And we learned that in, for every step of our career back in L'Oreal. Um, and you know, to make a decision when you're you know, above a, a certain threshold, you do need that data because no one may be thinking exactly like you. And you learn that sometimes you start a business or an idea coming from your personal need, but then you have to realize that everybody is different, everyone has a different need. So to listen to what the Glow Gang, our community is called Glow Gang, has to say about certain things, ask them questions, or just going through um, you know, some research data um, through our analytics is always important. I'm sure you guys do that all the time. But then that married with the creativity, the intuition is what we always try to, to balance. It's great. Recently, how recent? It was last week? Two weeks ago? Two weeks. Two, Two weeks, weeks ago? Yeah. Three weeks ago. Glow yeah. Recipe launched their first makeup product. So it's a lip product all in one. It's a scrub, tint, moisturizer. Um, really exciting. So we're raffling those. But question off of that, I think, you know, when we think about skincare, a lot of skincare brands try to venture into makeup and it's not always successful. So one, are there any brands that you really look up to who have done that expansion well? And then secondly, what, what made you guys want to kind of go into makeup after skincare? Mm. So um, just to start with the second question, um, I think that you know, more and more there are more blurred lines between categories because we want more, right? We all want to condense our routines, use less products, but get the most out of the time, that, the limited time that we've got and the limited resources that we've got. So it's one thing to give a lot of choices, but it's another thing to give these options that are really multifunctional, packed with multiple benefits that we're all looking for. So our thought process for creating this hybrid product of makeup and skincare is, you know, you don't need to have five different things to layer um, to get that achievement. I, I, you know, the idea was you still want to look really fresh while taking care of your skin, while enhancing the color of your lips. So it was a very simple idea actually to blur the lines by providing more with one product. And I think we're gonna see more and more of these hybrids, um, you know, beyond makeup and skincare too, with body, hair, we're seeing products that are usaged for, <laughs> for both parts of the body or skincare that can extend to the rest of the body. We're gonna see a lot of these blurred, interesting, innovative hybrids. So we wanted to tap into that. Um, and also I think it's just, you know, we use lip scrubs where you have to rinse off after a few minutes and then you have to apply the balm, wait a few minutes until it kind of melts into your mouth <laughs> and then use lip tint over it. I mean, it's just such a long process. So we wanted to make everyone's lives easier by using this product. Cool. I think we only have uh, maybe two or three questions left before we open it to the floor. I want to talk to you about trends. Mm. Um, you know, in beauty, trends come and go, I think, in the health and wellness space in general. How do you uh, differentiate between, you know, what's 
a trend, what's going to stay and what's going to fade, um, and what goes into the decision making for how you decide to produce your products. I mean, watermelon's a really interesting ingredient, for example. <laughs> of I think at the end of the day, for beauty, the product has to work. It comes back to efficacy. You have to see that result and fall in love with it. And that absolutely drives our product development process, which is why we always try to pair a fruit, a super fruit that is skin beneficial, rich in antioxidants, amino acids, vitamins, but also pair it with a potent active. So you see the combinations like watermelon plus AHA sleeping mask, avocado and encapsulated retinol eye cream, um, mag banana and magnesium for soothing, mm -hmm and a cream souffle cream, which was one of our latest moisturizer launches. And this kind of potent active meats fruit has also really helped us to kind of distill the message around ingredients and educate and make it less overwhelming so that you really understand what's going on your face. And we often brainstorm superfruits within the team because there's a lot of chatter about what is your next fruit going to be? So whenever we ask our community on social media, I never see as many comments as that, I suppose. <laughs> and like tons of fruit emojis. Um, but it's just really gratifying to see that type of engagement with the ingredients that we're choosing. I think one thing to add to the entire formulation process is that it's not only about what's in the product. So of course we want to pack our products with skin beneficial ingredients, but we also want to make sure that it's clean. And clean is a word that's very often not clear to customers. So what we do is we are as transparent as possible about what our definition of clean is, meaning no parabens, no mineral oils, no sulfates, phthalates, talc, BHT, um, certain ingredients, synthetic dyes, certain ingredients that we might not want in our skincare, and then outlining that on every single product page and ingredient page so that the customer has ready access to it. Um, and so that they're able to make informed choices. So that really ladders up to our whole formulation process. And are you seeing from the consumer side that there's more of a concern or um, interest in sustainability and the ingredients? Are you seeing that from your community? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we're all on the same page with that. We want to be very um, conscious of sustainability in every aspect, whether it's the packaging, the way formulas are made, or just the whole supply chain in general. So. You know, we, we have been conscious of that. I think we're more vocal even more now because we know that resonates with our audience. But, you know, we started our company with glass jars because they are recyclable and um, partially recycled. We use, you know, paper cartons that are recyclable and soy ink that can also be um, recycled. So we were very conscious of these decisions that we made, but we do want to make even more steps to get to a real sustainable brand. Um, and I know that that is a passion that we all share today. So definitely a focus. So to close us off, we'll have a quick uh, speed round here of just <laughs> five second answers. Um, what's your favorite skincare cosmetic treatment to indulge in? Oh, skincare treatment Among products? our products? Yes, among oh. your products. Oh avocado eye cream. Watermelon glow <laughs> sleeping mask. Or like self-care, something yes. in New York. Are there any? services or treatments that mm. are extra facials, special. massages, yeah. acupuncture. So it's a it's actually a secret that we share. <laughs> That's what there's, a, there's a secret Korean facialist in New York City mm. that we go to. She has her own little bed and um, underground space um, in Flatiron District and we book her over a cell phone <laughs> number and <laughs> she's been trained in Korea for over 20 years and so she's been our Godmother, actually, when it comes to skincare. <laughs> wow, top secret. Top secret. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is the one product you can't live without? Oh, avocado eye. Blueberry Bounce Gentle Cleanser. I use it day and night. Ooh. Yeah. And Paulina, you want to take the last one? Yeah. Um, you both have amazing skin. So, yeah. what are the last tips you can leave us with? Oh. I use a facial mist um, in between every step of skincare, whenever I can. And that's actually a great tip um, from K-Beauty that helps to soften your skin so when it's damp, the next step absorbs better and penetrates deeper into the skin while hydrating the skin all at the same time. So cleanse, mist, tone, mist, serum, mist, moisturize, mist, and you're just so glowy at the end of that. I'm going to try that. 
it's masking all the time. So I think there's this preconception that masking is this whole ordeal and you have to lie down for 20 minutes and it doesn't have to be that. Literally, I will wake up, not clean my face, just slather on the watermelon mask, tie my hair up in a bun, I'm picking up my clothes, I'm feeding my daughter breakfast. And by the time I'm ready to wash my face, I've had 10 minutes of masking in. So in this very fluid way, I just slot in masking whenever I can. Sometimes we're masking in the office at our desk and our team members like, can I come in? <laughs> like, sure. And we have meetings with the masks on. Like, it's just a very, once again, fluid, like uncomplicated kind of approach so that I can get my skincare and self-care in whenever and whenever. Great. Thank you guys for coming and sharing your story. Also love the pink blazers. Um, so my question is around um, the time you spent at L'Oreal learning. You mentioned some of the things that you did want to bring over in terms of the like French style discourse and the disagreement, the data driven decisions. I'd love to ask about the inverse of that. Um, what do you think these big like incumbent brands and companies don't do very well um, and is kind of contributing to the shift of smaller indie brands kind of nipping at their tails um, that you didn't want to bring over? Yeah, I love that question. I would say one of them is um, the speed factor. And the fact that you can experiment um, because you are a startup has been so instrumental for our growth and how we were able to shape our business model. So when we started um, Glow Recipe, you know, we started as a curation business model. And we had created our own brand in 2017. But at that time, we had so much going on. Right. And we were experimenting on what we were so passionate about. But at the end of the day, you have to really streamline to make sure that you're laser focused on what makes sense for, for the business. So I think that type of experiment today, we were able to streamline by terminating the curation business, actually, and really focusing on our innovations only. But it, it was a difficult um, decision to make. But it was something that we were able to do because we're an indie startup brand, because we're able to make the decision that's right for the business right away. So we're not losing time. And we know in our gut, but also the numbers were showing that this was the right direction. I think it was if it was a larger corporate, it would have taken years to make such a decision. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that was definitely a benefit of um, being in a startup. I was curious to know what are your skincare routines, either morning or night? <laughs> or, and also, what are your non-negotiable steps and what do you swap out or what do you experiment with? So for the basic building blocks of a skincare routine, what we educate on is that it starts with cleansing, toning, serum, and moisturizer. It's not 15 steps, it's not 100 steps, it doesn't have to be complicated, but that's kind of your foundation. And then within that foundation, you can do tweaks like Sarah does with her mist, or you can cocktail serum, multiple serums to target different skin concerns. So there's little things you can do to embellish on that. But following that basic structure, it's usually cleanse with blueberry bounce gentle cleanser. Um, because we always say to do a full 60 second cleanse, so that means like really getting in there. We notice with our customers very often, they're cleansing their face for like 10 seconds, but brushing your teeth for two minutes, like there's gotta be a little bit more going into the skin considering how many layers you put on in the morning. So if you do that, your toner is no longer an astringent wipe off kind of product. It's more that first leave on step of liquid hydration. So finding a really hydrating toner or you can use a mist to just plump the skin and ready it for next skincare steps. Then it's serum. Sometimes I layer a hydrating serum from um, one of our sister brands. <laughs> it's called Sweet Chef with the pineapple serum to get both hydration and brightening. And then I finish off with a very emollient moisturizer. So I tend to be very dry. So I love banana souffle cream because I also get very red. Um, so that's been my daily go-to every day. And then in the morning, always SPF. We don't have an SPF product yet, but we highly recommend whatever routine you do that you always finish in the daytime with a standalone SPF to protect the skin. Is SPF at the end? I've always, like, SPF is at the end okay, of the routine. <laughs> oh, I forgot oh. eye cream. <laughs> eye cream before the serum, so you're protecting your eye area with an ophthalmologist tested product. So very similar, um, and I love the exfoliating element of Blueberry Bounce Dental Cleanser, and I have combination skin. 
it, it can be very oily or sometimes dry. So I have a very predictable <laughs> wide spectrum of skin issues. Um, but the way to just control that is to exfoliate with a gentle cleanser or gentle exfoliator on a regular basis and then layering hydration. So the same order that Christine uses, but sometimes I layer two moisturizers from light to thick texture. So we have a watermelon pink juice moisturizer, which is a very lightweight, oil-free moisturizer that's packed with watermelon and pure extract I use that a, a generous amount leave it on for a little bit and then I would go on to a thicker moisturizer at night the banana souffle moisture cream because that really helps to seal everything in and nourish the skin by morning and if you have redness as a concern that's another um, really great solution so you guys said cleanser toner eye cream eye cream Sunscreen. Serum. 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 Moisturizer. Serum. <laughs> Hi. Um, I also use your avocado retinol cream, and I can say it's very good. It's the one thing that helped me really uh, deal with my issue. My question is more on, you touched on something a bit earlier about how no matter what you do, sometimes your skin is a reaction of how you feel. And to be honest, that's a great point. And there are days where I feel like no matter what you put, no eye cream or it's going to fix it. But then the standards I feel globally and even in South Korea in particular are so high for how and most of us here don't get enough sleep, don't get because, you know, we live we live in very high. And I think as women, a lot of times, you know, you want to put your best face forward. And, but it's just from a mental health perspective the beauty industry hasn't been so great in helping that. And although I love your page where all the models, you can see they have pimples or they have nests. But as a brand, I wanted to know if you had any plans on addressing a bit more the discourse of beauty and mental health. Yes, absolutely. And so we just started um, sort of talking about, you know, what hormonal changes or your sleep habits or stress levels can do to your skin. And, you know, even went into your age group because every age group actually has prominent issues that might vary. Um, and we wanted to really touch upon those because everyone has been asking for these types of approach education elements. I think we're gonna talk more and more about it because part of our mantra and what we believe in is, you know, skincare should be something that makes you feel good you know, beyond giving you great skin results, if you're enjoying those two minutes of your day and putting a smile on because you feel so great and after a quick routine, you feel better and more confident, I think that already elevates your mental health in a different way. So we wanted to really celebrate and embrace those moments, but also get deep into the science behind, again, the hormonal changes and whatever might affect um, your skin results or the breakouts. But yes, it's definitely our key focus. And to your point, we, we don't retouch our visuals. Um, you know, they're all makeup free for mm -hmm. you know, our skincare campaigns. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone can relate to our visuals and model imagery, um, which is why we're starting to use more models that have real acne issues. But I think they're beautiful as they are. So um, those are going to be more prominent as we go forward. Thank you for that. All right, and our last question. Hi, thank you so much for coming. I wanted to know about your personal development. Um, how do you grow as an individual? Um, how do you carve out time? And how do you invest back in yourself? Oh, that's such a great question. I think one of the tips we usually add to the two tips that we gave earlier is to find some semblance of balance with work because it's so easy to find yourself immersed and driven and constantly in that flow where you're working and on your emails and just working all the time, especially at a startup too. And it took us a while after launching Glow Recipe to find a little room for us to scale back. And what I mean by pull, scale back, it's kind of like pull back, take, just kind of take a breath and get inspiration outside of the workplace. Like go to museums or actually see a movie or just get inspiration from different sources other than work. Because I think if you don't do that, you burn out very, very quickly. And so for us, what we do is we sometimes go on little inspiration trips. We will just take a day off and like go tour the city to like look at new brands or how they're like doing their merchandising in store. We also encourage our team to sometimes do this as well so that they're picking and choosing what they're getting their ideas from because what you can get from behind a desk, behind a computer can sometimes be limited. Um, I think in terms of personal development, 
I have a seven-year-old daughter. She's turning eight soon. And because of that and the startup, there wasn't a lot of time left over. So what I try to do is I try to do activities with my daughter. And I think one of the best things about having a child is you kind of re-experience the world through their eyes because they're seeing things for the first time and you rediscover that joy and that wonderment. Um, so those little activities that we do on the weekend for me are another form of self-care. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, if you enjoy what you do, because you spend so many hours during the day at your office or the work that you do, and you kind of shift your mindset to think, I'm, this is part of what, I, what I'm doing, but I'm enjoying it. And I'm not really working because I'm, I'm smiling while I'm doing it. And if you have that philosophy, um, you know, versus it's six o'clock, I, I have to go home. Otherwise, you know, this is not a work-life balance situation. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's really a shift in mentality because if you're passionate about what you do, the hours shouldn't matter, honestly. You're achieving something that you believe in, you're passionate about, and if you enjoy the process, I think that's already a, a different mentality to begin with. Um, you know, I see a lot of people asking, how do you balance your work and life? You know, I say I, I, it's part of it's my daily life. Work is what I spend most of my time on, but I love it so much that it doesn't bother me. So again, it's how do you look at it is number one. Um, in terms of developing myself, you know, I'm somebody that um, thrives by interacting with others. So it's a very specific sort of personality that I have, but I try to you know, learn and pick up things from the conversations with the people that I interact with on a daily basis. And I think the beauty of being an entrepreneur is you get to meet so many people and so many, from so many walks of life, so many different team members, external partners, business partners, vendors, whoever that might be, everybody has something to offer to the table. And it might be something that you never realize and you could have this little aha moment and that could go a long way. So I think it's, a, it's actually another mind shift um, sort of element where if you're open to learning from the different people that you deal with every day, it, it's actually quite eye-opening um, and it's productive too. You know, you don't have to think, oh my God, I'm spending two hours talking to this person. I'm actually learning like little things from this person and there's always a takeaway. Yeah. Great. Well, let's give Sarah and Christine a big round of applause. Thank you for coming.